vice versa. And what are the guidelines that need to be followed uh, so far? What do we know uh, to the best of our ability through various guidelines? Right. So now when we talk about COVID-19 in pregnancy, the first thing I would want you to know is that pregnant women, you know, should follow the same recommendations as non-pregnant women, you know, to avoid exposure to SARS-CoV-2, right, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. Now, when they say you have to follow the same recommendations to avoid exposure, the WHO guidelines say, you know, wash your hands frequently, uh, practice social distancing, avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth, okay? When you are coughing or sneezing, please use your bent elbow for it or a tissue. So these are some general precautions that everyone, even pregnant women, need to take when we talk about uh, COVID-19 and that and pregnancy now what do we need to know when we talk about uh, you know uh, women who do not have COVID-19 right so if they do not have COVID-19 uh, so far what do they need to know now the thing is that you have to know that you don't have to panic okay so pregnant women are not more susceptible to consequences of COVID-19 right so in most of the cases the disease is going to be mild it is going to present in the same way like fever maybe some gi symptoms cough right and only and only if uh, you know women have comorbidities like diabetes hypertension asthma okay or a kidney or a liver disorder or if they have blood dysplasia or immunosuppression right these are the women who may be at a high risk for severe disease so uh, do not panic uh, in this time, right? Now, what we need to know is when we talk about women who do not have coronavirus or who have not been exposed to the coronavirus or are not at high risk of coronavirus and they are pregnant, they need to know certain general things that we are going to follow. Number one, reduce or the number of antenatal visits or you know you can increase the interval between antenatal visits. The recommendation is that should be a minimum contact four times in the pregnancy. So we should follow that. And, uh, you know, unnecessary contacts in the hospital should be avoided. Okay. Then in case you are going for an antenatal checkup, you should limit the duration of contact as well in the hospital. But as we say that, you know, we must continue necessary care, which is required for high risk women, right? Those uh, should not be compromised on. Also, there is no particular diet that women need to have when we talk about uh, especially coronavirus and pregnancy, right? And uh, uh, the general rule is a high protein diet. When we say high protein diet, there is also a doubt about, uh, you know, uh, risk from taking meat or chicken or eggs, you know. So far, uh, you know, the evidence says that there is no increased risk of coronavirus with the consumption of meat, egg or chicken, right? Uh, you have to follow uh, the simple principles of, uh, you know, the pandemic. So staying at home is a good advice. Social distancing is something that you should follow in the pandemic. Frequent hand washing, right? And respiratory hygiene, which we just talked about a little while ago. Then please, uh, as we say that, uh, you know, uh, you should avoid all non-essential travel, especially when we talk about cross-country travel, those should be avoided. And also, uh, when you are at home, definitely take care of home monitoring the blood pressure, weight, and a daily fetal movement count, right? So this is, or these are, I would say, some general advices that we do need to know when we talk about uh, pregnancy during the times of COVID-19. Now, what is the effect of COVID-19 on the fetus? So a lot of women are worried about in case they're asymptomatic, but they do have the infection, what would be the effect on the fetus? So now there are, there are a couple of reassuring things that we know so far, right? The first one is that there is no increased risk of miscarriage or early pregnancy loss if the woman acquires coronavirus, right? There is also currently no evidence of intrauterine fetal infection, okay, congenital malformations in the baby, no current evidence on 
the virus affecting the growth of the fetus. There is no current evidence on vertebral transmission or transmission through the genital fluids. Right? But yes, certain women who do tend to develop severe disease like pneumonia, right, do have increased frequency of preterm birth. Right now, this increased frequency of preterm birth could be iatrogenic or could be spontaneous. Now, in case there is a patient who is a confirmed case but is asymptomatic, then what are the principles we follow? So, if the patient is asymptomatic, we follow the principle of home isolation. Yes, obviously, there should be no comorbidities or no obstetric emergencies. You know, you are going to delay the routine things that you do like OGTT or growth scans and you're going to call up the patient after two weeks for fetal monitoring from the time of infection. There is no additional testing that is required and in case the woman develops an emergency, she should contact the maternity team. Right? Okay. Now, whenever you as doctors are going to see patients of coronavirus or suspected coronavirus or high-risk patients, do not forget to adorn the PPE. Okay? Now, women who are suspected or probable to have COVID-19, what should be the algorithm for them? Now, first of all, who are these women who have probable or you know, suspected COVID-19. Now, these are the women who may have certain symptoms like fever more than 38 degrees, cough, okay, or GI symptoms, or maybe difficulty in breathing. So they are suspected cases. Also, women are maybe probably having COVID-19 if they have a recent history of exposure, right, like travel to a place within last 14 days, uh, or coming in contact with a confirmed case. A close contact is defined as a distance of less than one meter for more than 15 minutes. Okay, or also if you're living together with a confirmed case. Now, whenever you have these women who are suspected or probable cases, they are not going to go to the routine antenatal care areas. They're going to go into specialized screening areas or triage areas. Now, in these triage areas, these women are going to be seen by the infectious disease specialist and an obstetrician. So the infectious disease specialist is going to do the risk assessment for them. And the most important thing they're going to find out is if these patients have any kind of high risk factors or they are at moderate risk. So do they have moderate or high risk factors or not? The obstetrician is going to see whether they have any obstetric emergencies or are they in labor. Okay. Now, if you know, so these are the two things that you're primarily going to consider. Do they have obstetric emergencies? Are they in labor? Or do they have moderate or high risk factors? Now, if the answer to these questions is no, so no high risk, no moderate risk, no emergency obstetrics, and not in labor, then these women are going to go for home isolation. So they were symptomatic or they had some history, but you know, we find out that they're not high risk and they don't have any emergency. So we are going to ask them to go into home isolation for 14 days. And after 14 days, if their symptoms are still persistent, then we are going to test them for the virus. Now, in case on assessment in the triage areas, these women belong to moderate or high risk or they have any obstetric emergencies, they are going to be admitted. Okay. They're going to be admitted in a special isolation room. And if they are in labor, they will go to the special isolation labor rooms. Okay. And on admission, these patients or women are going to be tested urgently. The testing that we are going to do or the sample that we are going to collect is going to be the nasopharyngeal swab. Right. Now, please do not delay any obstetric or emergency care to wait for the result. It is advised that we should treat the patients as positives until the result is available. Okay, now once you know that these patients are being admitted, we should know the criteria for ICU admission as well, right? So uh, the criteria for ICU admission is that in case they have a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 or it is more than 160 millimeters of mercury, if the diastolic blood pressure is more than 100 millimeters of mercury, the heart rate is less than 50 or more than 120, 
if there are no cases of preeclampsia and they have non-remitting headache or uh, you know epigastric pain or symptoms of impending eclampsia the respiratory rate less than 10 or more than 30 and if they have oliguria so then these women are going to be admitted to the ICU also for ICU admission we can also follow the sequential organ failure assessment tool which is the SOFA tool right and if any two out of the three are positive she's going to go to the ICU right which is a systolic blood pressure of less than 100 millimeters of mercury the respiratory rate of more than 22 millimeters of mercury and if they have altered level of consciousness right so these are the women who would need ICU admissions so now you know that we could either admit them in special isolation rooms special labor rooms which are again isolation rooms or in the ICU now on admission what is the surveillance that these women should undergo right so temperature charting the heart rate respiratory rate and blood pressure charting should be done at least three to four times a day you have to keep a check on their oxygen saturation and ensure that we are maintaining it at more than 95 now chest x-ray or a high resolution CT scan should be done only if indicated okay and in case you are doing it we should remember to take consent and do it with the abdominal shield as well then you know uh, you can consider uh, antibacterial or antibiotics and antiviral therapy you can also consider anti uh, you know thromboprophylaxis for these patients and definitely we should go in for the antipyretic therapy we know that uh, high temperature is detrimental to the baby right as far as fetal monitoring is concerned uh, we have to keep a check on fetal heart rate the woman should keep be keeping a check on the daily fetal movement count steroids are not to be given as such but yes in case the woman is at high risk for preterm birth then steroids can be given between 24 to 34 weeks because the benefits outweigh the risks so all women in their pregnancy, COVID or no COVID, you know, the WHO clearly says that even in the times of COVID, all pregnant women should have right to high quality care, which includes antenatal care, which we've talked about so far, the intrapartum care, which I'm going to talk about right now. Okay, then postnatal care, mental health, and even newborn care. Now, what should we know about management of labor and delivery in a woman who is either suspected or a confirmed case of COVID-19, right? So if she is with you for a long time, you already know the status, but if she comes in labor, then you will have to admit her and you have to do the testing for COVID-19. Now, as far as, you know, guidelines are concerned, these are the things that we know so far. That there is no evidence of favoring one mode of delivery over another right but generally we say that even for coronavirus in pregnancy cesarean section would only be done if there is an obstetric indication for it or if it is medically justified okay delivery has to be done in a isolation room please remember that COVID-19 is not an indication to induce labor in all women okay Yes, but some category women who are critically ill, in them delivery may be indicated. Now, once you know these things, we also should know that in case the woman acquires the infection in the third trimester, as I said, there is no urgency to deliver her. Right? Generally, what we have to follow is that you postpone delivery till you get a negative result for the virus or till the time the quarantine is lifted. Okay? As far as during labor or intrapartum is concerned, we follow standard guidelines for labor. But additionally, we would keep a check on oxygen saturation and ensure that it is more than 95%. You keep a check on respiratory symptoms. Preferably do a continuous fetal monitoring in these women. Do not give tocolytics. Okay, so tocolytics are contraindicated. The time in labor should be limited. So if she is in prolonged labor, you need to take the necessary steps. Labor analgesia can definitely be given. It is not contraindicated. Okay. As we mentioned previously, the cesarean section is going to be reserved for obstetric indications or when it is medically justified. 
right? In case you're taking her out for a cesarean section, regional anesthesia is going to be the anesthesia of choice. GA is, you know, avoided because it is considered as aerosol limiting procedure. Uh, for some cases where there is severe respiratory compromise, we may be giving a general anesthesia. Now, we are going to follow the same protocol for delayed cord clamping as uh, in known COVID patients. And yes, breastfeeding is to be encouraged. In case the patient is ill or unwell, then she can, you, you know, she can practice other forms of feeding, for example, expressed milk or uh, you know, donor human milk as well. Even the WHO guidelines on this say that a woman with COVID-19 should be supported to breastfeed easily, even to hold her newborn child with skin-to-skin -skin contact and to share a room with her baby as well. Okay, just that while she's doing all these things, she should take the necessary precautions like practice respiratory hygiene, she should wear a mask, she should always wash her hands before and after handling the baby, and routinely clean and disinfect the surfaces. So these are the things or the guidelines that we know so far as, as far as pregnancy and COVID-19 is concerned. I hope you find the video useful. And, you know, since this is, uh, this is a topic which will, you know, keep evolving over a span of time, if there are any changes, we will let you know. Thank you so much.